uh, commercial has access way requirements too. Um, the most important one being this walkways every 150 feet requirement. And I'll tell you why. Um, you know, some safety codes can seem a little excessive, uh, but there's actually been a few solar fires uh, that have burned down some buildings, particularly notable in the commercial sector. Uh, but I do hear more about commercial solar fires than residential solar fires. So, yeah, I wouldn't just say that these are more notable fires. I'd say they're more frequent for commercial solar, even though they're still rare. You know, a big solar commercial fire was the Dietz Watson warehouse fire. It was a 11 alarm fire in New Jersey back in 2013. Uh, there was also a Bakersfield fire in Target in 2009. Um, these fires occurred for a few reasons. You know, most solar installers know that um, the old school combiner boxes combined with the old school inverters, which had a negative grounding uh, in their ground fault protection, had a blind spot. And so if a fault were to occur on the rooftop, under a very particular kind of freak circumstance, uh, it would uh, trigger a cascading effect where basically the combiner box would become a weak point. The combiner box would start ground faulting and cause all the circuits eventually to ground fault. Uh, you know, there's no off switch on a solar array. And it's not like you can put a blanket over you know, an entire commercial array. And so this problem has been mitigated by updates in the inverter ground fault detection circuit uh, that will turn the inverter off, although you still have issues on the DC side. So the, the primary cause of the fire is not this blind spot in the inverter. You know, that might have been a failure in the control system, but not the original cause. Um, the, the, the fundamental cause of these solar fires has to do with the hot metal conduit carrying the, the home run cables from the array back to, you know, wherever the inverter is. This, this home run and metal conduit uh, due to thermal expansion, you know, metal conduit on the rooftop can pull out of its fittings. You know, so this walkway requirement of putting walkways every 150 feet, uh, you know, it, it really is there to also get you to, to break up your conduit runs, too. You, know, you have to be, you have to use expansion joints on your conduit runs uh, and, and also make sure that the conduit is not uh, being strapped too aggressively to the pipe supports, you know, the you know, the, the best way to do it is to use cable tray rather than conduit. Basically, whenever your, your metal cable runs are greater than 120 feet long, you have to start thinking about thermal expansion and how to relieve that in your home run circuits. So... If your commercial building has a slanted roof, it would qualify as a residential type roof and follow the residential fire code offset requirements. So here we have a small commercial one-story building, and we're going to stay three feet off the sides, three feet off the top, and uh, you know, we're going to stay off the skylights. Although if you're, you're actually looking at the scale of this, we're only staying two feet off the skylights and uh, you know, the, the best idea is to stay four feet off the skylights. Certainly serviceable equipment like air conditioning units, you wanna maintain that four foot perimeter, uh, not only for building code, but electric code. Um, for a skylight, you might think, oh, it's not serviceable equipment, but it still has this flashing around the skylight that you want to be able to access and repair if ever need be. And so, you know, I actually recommend staying four feet off the skylights. 
Um, at, at this point, it's how many rectangles can we fit into the larger polygon? You know, so get out your module dimensions. You, know, you add a little bit of width for your racking clips. We're going to show you how to do this in just a minute. So here's almost our final array layout. But since I have a little bit of space left over of usable space east to west, you know, the very last thing I might do is shift the whole array over a couple of inches just to center, you know, this solar panel to be directly over the front entrance of the building so that it you know, appears a little more square from the ground. You know, the door is actually offset from the center of the building, but, you know, we're close enough that it would look more awkward if, you know, the array was centered to the roof, but not the front door. And we have a little bit of flexibility there uh, because we haven't tried to squeeze every single square inch of roof space out of the rooftop, although we've we've done a pretty good job in this array. So finding the right starting point for your solar array, locating the, the very first rafter on the inside of the array perimeter that your rail is then going to get attached to is really a, a skill you only pick up in construction. We're going to talk about rafter identification in a little bit. Sometimes it's easier to do uh, on certain roofs like metal roofs you can kind of see how the metal panels align to understand what's going on underneath the rooftop. Um, you know, on a particularly tough roof, to make sure that the array is, is centered where you want to be, uh, installers will start right in the middle of the roof instead of the edge and then work their way out rather than trying to guess where the finishing point is. Um, I have a different way of doing it we're going to talk about in a little bit once we learn a little bit more about our racking. Um, you know, in my experience with roof leaks, it's not the solar array itself that will leak. Uh, but instead, it's the existing stuff already on the roof that might start to leak because it's not given the same careful consideration as the solar array itself is by the work crew. You know, a rooftop is not designed to be a job site. So even walking around on a shingle roof can be bad for the roof. So you might make all these penetrations for your attachment points throughout the entire array and use good workmanship, and they're not going to leak. But if this area around the skylight becomes a, a walkway for installers working on the job site, it'll be the flashing around the skylights that begin to leak. Now, so the, the solar array itself should extend the life of the roof. Now the primary reason that shingles degrade is exposure to sunlight, but that assumes you're not going to have people walking around on your rooftop during the installation of a solar array, for example. So to reduce the wear and tear on the roof during the construction, I try and do as much pre-assembly on the ground as possible. You know, I'll build my solar rails on the ground and mount my module level panel electronics to the rail. And I'll plan out my wiring and installation approach as much as I can to reduce that time spent on the roof, doing as much pre-assembly as possible. You know, the goal is to have an aesthetic and accessible solar array. We eventually replaced, you know, just got rid of the skylights and moved some panels on the back of the roof and filled it in, and made it look a lot better that way. So 
this should have been in a earlier part of our discussion, you know, kind of about net metering versus avoided cost. You know, if you don't have a net metering policy that entitles you to retail price of electricity, you know, even sometimes retail price electricity is not retail price because there's fixed fees on top of that. So your net metered retail price is actually less than your state's average retail price, which would include those fixed fees. And then there could also be the avoided cost buyback rate. And just uh, on a finer note, keep in mind that the price of electricity varies seasonally. And so, you know, if your electric rate is higher in the summer than in the winter, you know, a shallower tilt array can be more cost effective um, than a steeper tilt array at the ideal tilt angle. And furthermore, the avoided cost buyback rate varies seasonally and can be higher in the summer and lower in the winter. Now, so this was more of our, our array layout. You know, south is great for the most system production. If you have net metering, south is great for the most amount of value. Um, you know, west is good for evening and east is good for morning. And then, you know, so when I approach a rooftop, I'll typically fill up as much of the south roof as the budget allows and then move on to the west roof and then the east roof as budget allows. And then if I still have budget left over, move on to the north side of the roof. So, but that'll be the, I would never do a north facing solar array by itself. But, you know, if you have the budget to cover the entire roof with solar, you know, consider it as the last roof surface to use, particularly if you have a shallower tilt roof, not a steeper tilt roof. You know, there's there's economies of scale, and we we kind of talked about that yesterday. This is the illustration; it should be further up in the program. But you know, basically, this this example is a little extreme. But let's say the the choice is between installing a a small south facing rooftop you know, that might be you know four kW of panels. And there's a base amount of money that an installer needs to make to get up on your roof and put the solar array on. So if he's doing a smaller system, he's going to charge a higher dollar per watt. And then you back out the tax credit. And then we have our PV watts production figure and our cost of electricity. And so we have a dollar per watt figure after our units cancel out. And we have a watt per year figure and a dollar figure here. So we see that this small solar array has a 21 year payback, whereas a, a larger array that covers the entire rooftop, the same installer may be able to sell you at a much lower price. And so even though the production difference between the south facing array and the south plus north facing array you know, the south plus north facing array makes less production per panel, but maybe that production is better oriented towards the summertime. Maybe the effective generation rate is worth more. You know, on top of that, it's this, this lower installation price due to economies of scale that substantially reduces the system payback. So by and large, and particularly if you have a good net metering policy, doing the largest system possible is a good approach. If you don't have good net metering, uh, you have to do a more detailed analysis on whether doing a small system is the only thing that makes sense, and, you know, hoping that it's not just the payback that the electricity generates, but also the added value to your home. You know, you do a $10,000 solar project, it'll add $10,000 to the sales price of your home, uh, because the value that solar adds to your property is not directly related to the cost savings of the electricity. It's just what makes the home more attractive to a new home buyer. That new home buyer isn't doing the calculations in his head. He just thinks it's a solar home, so it's an energy efficient home. I'm going to buy it. That, that may or may not be mathematically true, 
um, it's the curb appeal is the added value that a, a solar array will play. So maybe a, a you know, 4.6 kilowatts times 450 a watt, you know, that's going to be about a $19,000 solar project. And it might add $10,000 of property value to the home. Now, here's a much larger array, 13.3 kilowatts times 275 a watt. You know, that's not going to be a $19,000 project. That's going to be, you know, closer to a, I don't know, a, a $35,000 project. It might only add $10,000 in property value to the home, even though it's much larger and it generates more electricity. You know, that's not really what drives it. And so for small projects where you can't take advantage of the economies of scale and you're faced with a high installation price, you know, well, at the very least, you're not outflowing onto the grid and you're maintaining, you know, some of your investment in the property value. On larger projects, the property value is less of an issue and the projects are really making or breaking based off of simple payback. Anyway, moving away from our policy discussion, let's explore some racking components. Um, the basic way solar is attached to the roof is through this system of solar rails and brackets that are called ELFI. Um, 10 years ago, integrated ELFI with flashing did not exist, but uh, this is the standard kind of shingle attachment methodology today. Uh, flashing a shingle roof is not a perfect nor easy process. Uh, if you're doing new construction with shingles and you can get the solar installer out there early, the flashing can be placed uh, onto the roof deck before the shingles are put onto the roof. And that has some advantages. Uh, even on a new roof, you have to slide this flashing underneath not just this course of shingles, but the next one. And that involves sticking a pry bar underneath the shingles and prying out uh, roofing nails. You know, particularly if the roofer is trying to do a good job and puts in a lot of roofing nails rather than a few, that can become a nightmare for the solar installer. Uh, and you have to be all the more careful so that you don't rip the shingles and on a slanted hot rooftop being careful you know it's not a job that all people can um, you know keep their heads on and and do um you know, but but it's the standard get under the shingle pry up some roofing nails and uh you know you have some caulk and you slide the flashing under you know get the whole covered by and sealed up by the flashing. You, know, you put some sealant underneath the flashing as well and then cover the hole. Uh, flashed attachments are now standard on a tile roof. It used to be you would have hooks that would kind of snake out under the tile, um, but that obviously would not have the tile be flat and there's so many different tile shapes and you don't want your roof to go to the orthodontist you know on this spanish tile job site we had to custom manufacture our own brackets because we couldn't find any to fit the shape of our roof uh, now racking companies such as quick mount kind of specialize in making replacement roofing tiles that have standoffs in them for the l feet to attach to now, this is a clip for a standing seam metal rooftop, which we'll be talking about in a minute. But regardless, you know, you have these L feet that the rail is attached to. You know, back in the day, the L feet didn't have flashing. You just goop them up and lag screwing them to the roof. The solar industry has evolved. Now we have integrated flashing products, um, which are the best practice.
you know, how the solar panels are secured to this racking is also pretty standard. You get end clips, which go at the edge of the rail and kind of clamp the module down onto the rail. And you have mid clips, which go in the channel of the rail and clamp the two modules between the mid, you know, that neighbor, the mid clip down onto the rail. And so the attachment gets lag screwed into the roof, usually into the rafter. And the rail gets bolted to the L foot and then the clips secure the module onto the rail. Well, every manufacturer has little nuances in their hardware components, some which make the installation easier than others. Uh, they still use this generally universal system of L feet, rail, mid clips, and end clips on residential type roofs as a, as a standard. You know, pro installers are going to hit every single rafter as they go across the rooftop and do so in a way where you're not making Swiss cheese out of the roof. And so the way to hit every single rafter, which may be 16 inches on center, whereas your racking span between attachments is allows for a much longer span. And so to maintain the span of the rack, but hit every rafter as you go across the roof, you stagger your L feet. That will result in the fewest penetrations, which most evenly distributes the load over the entire roof truss. So only the most experienced installers go for staggered L feeds. You know, the, the standard way to do it is just to put all the rafter, you know, all the attachment points kind of square, skipping over certain rafters. But, you know, there's really no reason not to stagger the L feet with the right planning. You know, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, I'm partial to certain racks over others. I like this particular profile of rail that has a, a U shape into it. If we look at the, the previous example of rail, you know, here's our here's our U shape, but some of these U channels can be very thin for very thin T bolts to put down into. Other U channels can be very thick that are more like a unistrut uh, washer, you know, a big thick rectangular washer, and you get a wider U channel. I like a very wide U channel because if this U channel is wide enough. The cable, which other racking companies run down the side over here, you get a wide enough U-channel, the cable can just lay in to this channel. And so I'll put my home run cables into this channel before mounting, say, the module level panel electronics. And that way the cables are protected from critters and birds and you know anything else, the roof for that matter. Um, rather than being just shoved into this side channel that's really not good enough and then going around L feet and having that cable droop down onto the roof deck itself uh, where it, it operates at a higher temperature and also it's more exposed to potential damage. And so what I'll do is kind of pre-assemble some of my sticks of rail and then run my home run cables down the top channels and then mount the optimizers to the rail where they're supposed to go and lift that all up in one piece to the rooftop. It's relatively lightweight. You just click it in. That way I'm doing all my module level optimizer mounting and, and some of my rooftop cabling uh, and any rail-to-rail -rail splice points, doing that all down on the ground where the work is more comfortable, you can do a better job, and you're not degrading your uh, shingles by 
tromping around up on the rooftop. Oh, there are cable management systems associated with these systems. You can use tie wraps for cable management to secure the home run cables and the module cables to the rail. Uh, it's more common to use cable clips that clip onto the module frame, then the excess cables get shoved into these clips. Neither solution is perfect. Uh, the cables can come out of the cable clips. <laughs> then again, the tie wraps, the cables can't come out <laughs> of the tie wraps, and the tie wraps have a reputation for failing over time, although that's not you know, my experience with good quality outdoor rated tie wraps. Then again, I haven't been in the industry for 25 years, so, you know, I use tie wraps differently than cable clips. Cable clips are good for tucking extra surplus cable out of the way. Tie wraps are good for permanently securing the wire to where it needs to go. Uh, but in my system, I'll do preliminary cable management you know, by, you know these, these optimizer to optimizer whips are problematic because now you have module to module whips that plug in here from the solar panel. And then with module level panel electronics, you've added optimizer to optimizer whips. So I'll pre-assemble this rail on the ground and then use tie wraps to keep that cable in the channel where it's supposed to go. And then once I mount the modules onto the rail, that U-channel now gets completely covered by the frame of the solar panel. So I'll use the tie wraps to kind of pre-position the cable into the rail and then mount the modules on top. That'll permanently secure the cable into the rail. So I know that for the life of the system, that droopy cable on the rooftop is managed and secured by the module and the clamping system itself and not through cable clips or tie wraps that could fail with time. And then another trick that I've discovered uh, for module level panel electronics, which are very popular, if not required in your jurisdictions for uh, you know, most solar arrays, most roof mounted solar arrays, is instead of putting the optimizer directly behind the panel, which creates this uh, kind of uh, juggler's trick when you're, when you're putting the panel onto the rail and you're managing all this droopy cable underneath while plugging in those cables, while tucking the panel on top and trying to maintain your cable management at the same time you're laying the module down, it's, it's you know, at least it's a two person job well, what I do instead is I locate my optimizer to the next module over. And that allows me to first mount the solar, you know, after everything's pre-assembled and the optimizer's already hanging out on the rail right there, I go down and I mount the panel right next to it. And then I take these droopy panel cables and wrap them around each other to get rid of the slack before plugging it in. And that gets rid of all this extra surplus slack, which can easily just be left by the installer underneath the array to just kind of drag on the roof over the life of the system. You know, the, the goal is to be able to look underneath the solar array and see all the way across. You can barely see these little boxes and cables right here because they're feeding directly into the U-channel of the rail, which has been covered by an end cap that kind of transitions out of the array right here back to our inverter, which is in this case mounted on the side of the building. And that way all those cables are, are pretty out of sight and out of mind for critters. You know, as far as other options go because it's not a perfect option. You still have the wires that are unprotected before they go into the rail, you know, which is the good enough solution. The best solution is to put what's called a, a, a solar array skirt 
or a rodent skirt along the side of the solar array. Sometimes they're called squirrel guards. You know, how good are they? You know, I have my doubts. You know, they restrict airflow. You know, I think if a squirrel really wants to get in there, he'll be able to. Um, they're probably good at preventing birds from nesting underneath the array. Um, but I think through good basic racking selection, you know, a, a squirrel guard is a costly add-on. You know, selecting a, a rail with a U-channel in it that will protect the bulk majority of your cable is just a matter of selecting one racking product over another racking product. So, you know, particularly on commercial systems, the lack of integrated cable management in the array can become very problematic. So I'm, you know, again, when we're establishing budget priorities, I would gladly rob the solar panel of budget if it meant that I got better quality solar racking and cable management. Not that you always have to make a either or decision like that. Now these are interesting. These are called snow guards. And what they're there for is to catch snow so it doesn't slide off the roof all at once. So in areas of heavy snow, uh, these can prevent snow from avalanching off the roof all at once. That might be bad for not only people below, but maybe the gutter system that's at the edge of the roof. The, the standard way to mount rail is to have the modules be in landscape, I mean, sorry, in portrait, and run the rail across the roof, you know, from east to west. Purlins are a little bit more difficult to mount to uh, because when you're running your attachments east to west, you know, you have rafters every 16 inches, and you can just kind of, you know, as long as you know where your, your rafters are, you have a lot of flexibility and range on where this rail is landed. There's particular zones that you have to land the module in uh, to maintain its structural integrity, at least maintain your module warranty. So the, the purlin spacing if you have east-west purlins instead of north-south rafters, that can complicate your, your racking design uh, rather substantially. You, know, you might have to, on purlins, uh, go with you know, a non-contiguous array um, or just end up using more racking rather than less racking. Uh, it's, so purlins, you have to take a much closer look at your array layout to make sure that the, the spacing between your module frame and the purlin is, is right for your entire solar array. It's generally more of a problem when you have multiple rows of solar panels, and so you have to have the whole array span across multiple purlins. Uh, it might be that changing the orientation of the modules is the uh, best way to go. You know, so we then in one project we encountered a a relatively weak roof with three purlins going across it, and uh, we had to reinforce the uh, the roof structure underneath because the purlins were not well attached to the rafters, uh, and so we went with a shared rail system so that we could go and put additional reinforcement brackets along one, along the middle purlin, uh, and better secure the middle purlin uh, to the rafters. So running the rail across the roof east to west is standard. Running the rail north to south is possible, uh, but it's not preferred because when you run the rail north to south, particularly on a rafter system, you are uh, uh, skipping over rafters. And even when you're running the rail north to south on a purlin system, you're still skipping over how the purlin distributes the load uh, across each rafter. 
I've done Perlin systems where the engineers come back and said, you know, if the Perlin, if you're on Perlins, you got to go with two foot on center spacing, even though the racking can maintain, you know, four to six feet on center because they wanted the uh, load to be as evenly distributed across the roof truss as possible. You know, finding the the rafters is another process that someone in construction can do a lot better than a do-it-yourselfer. You know, the the standard practice, what I do, is get up on the roof with a rubber mallet and a whiteout pen and tap the roof. And I'll do it in a couple of locations, you know, going along the bottom of the roof, the middle of the roof, the top of the roof. And everywhere I think I'm hitting a rafter, I'm going to mark with my whiteout pen. And after I've done three lines, I'm going to look at my marks and see if I'm actually identifying rafters or false positives because you can get into the attic and measure out your rafter spacing. And even if they vary approximately, you can still see if you're, you're following the overall pattern or not. Once you figure out where the rafters are with the tapping system, you can pop them with chalk lines uh, to remain on center. If you are slightly off, then that's you know what the, the flashing helps forgive. If you're slightly off and you drill your hole, you can feel it in the drill that you missed the rafter, you know, back up, fill the hole in with sealant and cover it with flashing. You can also use a stud finder to identify rafters, but you cannot use just your regular $30 stud finder. It's actually like a, a $600 used $2,000 new stud finder. And the, the gritty coarseness of the shingles, even on a $2,000 brand new stud finder, uh, will throw off the stud finder. So you have to take a, a thin piece of cardboard up on the rooftop to drag the stud finder across the roof so that it can see the rafters underneath. You know, the feature is the depth of the stud finder. So these are like almost borderline concrete scanners. The very next step up in stud finders get you into like $10,000 stud finders that are used for examining building concrete foundations. So there's a pretty big range in price between tapping the roof with a rubber mallet and a $2,000 uh, stud finder for identifying where the rafters are. You know, guess and check <laughs> is not the best method. You know, I will get into the attic and measure it out from the building wall and uh, try and be as precise as possible. You know, because you, you have to guess closely so that the, the flashing covers it if you miss. If you do miss, your rafter installers will carry a, a piece of wire up on the roof that they'll stick down in the hole. It's a curved piece of wire. They'll give it a twist. And they can kind of feel how close of a miss uh, they are at. Well, the general practice is to get up on the roof, tap it with a hammer, and uh, identify where the rafters are, pop your chalk lines, uh, then drill out a hole in the roof for your lag screw. Um, Secure the, you know, after covering your, you know, misses with any mastic or, uh, you know, you, you seal up the underside of your flashing, pry up those shingles, shove it under there, screw in a lag screw, and that makes your kind of waterproof uh, seal. Now, this is a, a metal roofing attachment where there's no standing seam. This is like a, a variant on corrugated metal. I actually like this attachment. It screws into the roof. There's some waterproof butyl tape right here. You can see it. You can feel it. You know, if you're like metal screwing into a purlin, you know, it's a very tight, very well sealed uh, attachment point. I like going on, I like drilling holes through a metal roof more 
then the other popular metal roofing approach, which is a standing seam metal roof selling you clips which attach to the standing seam. Uh, there's a weakness in this standing seam approach because instead of lag screwing into the purlin or the rafter, you're now clipping on to the seam and relying on the strength of how the standing seam is attached to the roof, which is nowhere near as strong as a lag screw screwed into the rafter. So the advice from standing seam man manufacturers is to clip to every single seam to get the best load distribution across the standing seam roof. And most installers don't want to do that because you know, they think they're saving money by not buying the rail of a traditional racking system instead of just buying these clips. But then it turns out they have to buy a whole lot more clips. And so the, the railless racking systems can sometimes cost more money than the rail-based systems. Aluminum solar rail is not that expensive. Yeah, these, these are a new product. These are conduit supports for metal roofing, which I think is a, a great idea to help keep that, that conduit, particularly on hot metal roofs, uh, elevated. Uh, that's what you know, I prefer to go straight into the roof and not have to deal with metal conduit on a hot roof. So speaking of, here's a picture of a Spanish tile replacement standoff. Um, where you could transition conduit through it into the roof instead of using it as a proper standoff by stubbing up, you know, pipe through it. You can find these, they're called pipe boots at your local hardware store. Uh, quality does vary. Um, experienced solar installers are comfortable drilling a hole through the roof. You know, it's not just the attachment points for the lag screws. It's drilling the hole for your internal conduit run. Uh, installers will, who don't do that will say, well, I like you know keeping the conduit outside the roof because I'm not drilling a hole in the roof. Well, you're drilling tons of holes in the roof when you're attaching your solar array to the roof. Now, so experienced solar installers should be comfortable with drilling and sealing holes and roofs. I like to put this transition point at the very last solar panel on the corner of the array. Uh, I use, if here's my roof and here's my solar array, I used to put these transition boxes in the top corner of the array so that they would reduce the total amount of water that might be rushing over that point. Um, I now put them in the bottom corner of the array uh, unless the attic space is so narrow at that point it's not accessible, um, basically because <laughs> then I can usually access it without climbing all over the roof system if if ever need be. Now this is a specialized rooftop transition box for solar called a Solideck. It has uh, integrated flashing underneath to get up under the shingles. Uh, the cable's coming up out of the attic to land on a terminal block that meets up with solar cables from the rooftop. Uh, that enter through a, a cable gland. So the solar cables are coming in through the roof here. Now, of course, this is a specialized box and it costs about $100 just for the empty shell. Now, sometimes I'll just get the empty shell and move my cables just all the way down through and do some uh, junction work in the attic. The presumption being if I have to access that box in the future, it's easier sometimes to get into the attic than it is to get up on the roof. Uh, it depends on your solar design whether you're allowed to do that uh, per code.
but I'm generally dealing with module level panel electronics. And at that point, you know, I'm really trying to run my PV cable all the way down to the inverter if possible. You know, the internal run is particularly long. Uh, well, I'll, I'll actually tell you what I do <laughs> right now. You know, DC conductors inside your building are required by code to be protected in metal conduit. So it's confusing because metal conduit is commonly associated with, you know, grounding. Can you carry your ground path through your metal conduit? Oh, you're using metal conduit. You're using it as a ground path. That's not why DC cabling needs to be in metal conduit. It's uh, more for physical protection. You know, uh, a rodent is less likely to chew up a wire if it's contained in metal conduit. A nail or a screw is less likely to puncture through uh, metal compared to plastic or no protection, such as AC Romex. So this physical protection requirement of DC wiring to be in metal is, is kind of DC discrimination as there's no similar requirement for utility feeder cables uh, supplying AC inside a building to be contained in metal, such as distribution cables between uh, uh, service panels. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, sometimes solar installers will select an inverter system to go up on the roof completely called microinverters uh, that gives you AC right out of the panel and they'll do it specifically to avoid running metal conduit through the attic. Instead, they can just use regular AC Romex through the attic and that's certainly an easy method to do. Uh, We'll talk more about the cost later. You know, it turns out the microinverters are the most expensive kind of inverter system, but it turns out that that same cost has advantages that make them particularly well suited for do-it-yourselfers. I like the DC optimizer platform instead of the microinverter platform because it does it has similar advantages in terms of system performance at a lower price point but then I have DC coming out of the array instead of AC. So I prefer DC systems you know, with one inverter down on the ground, and that requires metal enclosed home run circuits from the array to the inverter. So what I do is I buy a pre-bundled cable uh, called MC cable, which stands for metal clad cable. But conductors are already bundled together and a metal wrapping that encloses them fully. Now this is pretty expensive stuff. One circuit of MC cable uh, contains two full-sized cables plus a ground. And this particular one that I use costs just under $3 per foot. And then sometimes I get the same cable, but with four conductors, instead of two, and this particular cable, call, MC cable, costs $3.50 per foot. And what I like about this cable with the four conductors is that gives me two circuits, two positives, two negatives, plus a ground. You know, it's expensive, but because it's pre-bundled, it can be quickly just put up in the attic and strapped to rafters while meeting the DC metal requirement making a code compliant installation go very quickly. So I'll stub up this MC cable into the Solideck box uh, and then run it through the attic, then come out the soffit on the north side of the building. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So I guess let me let me draw a little illustration, then I'll get to a picture. But you know, often the solar array is on the south side of the building, and you don't want your um, I drew that roof way too big. You don't want your power electronics. You don't want your inverter to be 
on the south side of the building where the sun is, you want to protect them from full exposure to sun. So you'll often put your, your power electronics or even the point of interconnection uh, to a, a home where the meter is located is rarely on the south side of a building. It's more on, it's, it's usually on the north side. And so sometimes staying outside of conduit and wrapping, you know, coming all the way to the edge of the roof and then running your conduit up the roof and down the roof and down the side is a longer path than, you know, running MC cable through the attic and then coming out the soffit here and then inverter mounted to the side of the building here. Uh, however, when you use MC cable, you have to be aware that MC cable is only rated for damp conditions rather than wet conditions, uh, which makes sense because the metal wrapping is not as complete as a metal tube like EMT conduit. Yet outside the building is a wet condition environment unless that outdoor area is sheltered, such as a covered parking area or an awning or a porch. Uh, in, in other words, a damp condition is an outdoor area that's not exposed to uh, sprinkler systems or rainfall. Uh, you know, furthermore, MC cable is not to be installed in an area that's subject to extreme damage, uh, such as along a driveway where a car could kind of crash into it. But I still use MC cable. And so what I do is, um, you know, I terminate, I poke my MC cable out of the soffit and then add a junction box up at the top of the roof and then transition into EMT for the rest of my run. You don't necessarily need a junction box to do that. So I'll buy the cable length and then I'll strip back the excess MC cable, then put a connector on and then right here out of the attic, finish it up in EMT and claim that the MC cable is being protected by the soffit since it's a, a short stub. If I'm in an area where I know the inspector is not going to want to see any MC cable coming out of the roof, then I'll have to go up and through the soffit into the attic and put a junction box in the attic and do my transition to EMT at that point. We have a question. So uh, if you have a fairly long feed to the panels from the inverter, is it, is it acceptable to use parallel cables? Uh, parallel cables is allowed, uh, but only for very large systems at very high amperages. So you won't get into that uh, level in, in residential type systems. Um, for for very long distances, where we have another technique for that. So I think you're only allowed to use parallel cables when they're like uh, one. I think it's one aught or larger. We covered in our code class, um, but you're never up at that size with your solar conductors. You would only be at that size for you know incredibly large commercial inverter output systems or uh, or battery cables can get up that when you're going from like a 48 volt system to a 240 volt system. On the 240 volt side, you'll have high voltage and low amperage. On the 48 volt side, you'll have low voltage and high amperage. Then you might get into parallel runs. And then uh, for, you know, for most home runs on that matter, speaking of cable thickness, you only need to use, you know, at most number eight for solar. And then, uh, you know, many times solar installers will use number 10. That's because this is typically like a, a 10 amp cable. And by the time you get up to like number eight, you're starting to get into 45, 50 amps. You're really sizing that cable to accommodate a uh, voltage drop. But with this MC cable technique, I'll usually go crazy and use number six. The reason being that the ground which is undersized will be a number eight ground. And the solar array up on top of the roof needs to be grounded and number eight is the minimum size. 
And so by buying this MC cable upsized, I get that number eight ground, which serves as my ground wire between the inverter system and the uh, rooftop. And so the name of the game is finding the right like balance electrical balance of system equipment to plan this transition uh, in, uh, in in an, in an easy way. Uh, I think the easiest way is to use the Solidec uh, transition box, although you know you can piece it together through off the shelf items found at your local hardware store, with the exception of these kind of specialized cable glands. Uh, which are really just made for the, the solar industry uh, because the solar cable is a little bit thicker than, than other kinds of cable. You know, the, 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 the real danger is when you try and plan your rooftop transition without relying on solar specialty parts, is uh, you get this kind of ugly junction box kind of just sticking up, uh, hanging out on the rooftop. I will normally put this rooftop transition box underneath the solar array. So I will, you know, put racking here and racking here and then cover, you know, that box up with the solar panel to give it some additional protection from the wind and the rain. But this is a, a low profile box you know, most junction boxes, this is not a junction box, this is just a pull box. Most junction boxes are six inches deep, and that's going to stick out too far up off of the array to hide it underneath. Now, if I'm doing, if I'm trying to eliminate the junction box entirely from the rooftop, you know, what I'm doing is coming up in a pipe boot and then immediately turning 90 degrees with the fitting and then coming out of a cable gland right then and there. So I might run my solar cable, which is rated to be outside of conduit, completely off the roof and into the attic, uh, and then land you know, uh, a box, a transition box, where you transition from your solar cable to your MC cable or solar cable to your THHN with EMT run. Uh, that's traditionally located up on the rooftop uh, lately, I've been more of a fan of running the solar cables into the attic and putting the box in the attic because it's more accessible. That box does not have to be readily accessible, not like your shutdown switches do. All right, let's see where we're at. Okay, sometimes it's necessary to build a jumper cable between two sections of a solar array. You have a solar array over there, a solar array over there. You need to connect the two together. You build a jumper cable on the roof. So jumper cables might go back into the attic or they might be kept up on the rooftop. Uh, for example, if I have two subarrays, I'll install two Solideck boxes on the rooftop and since I'm just running one circuit from one solar deck box to the other for this solar solid for this jumper cable I'll run one set of my MC cable between the two uh, junction boxes um, we have a question it says is lightning protection needed up on the rooftop or does the ground wire cover this uh, the best way to protect the array from lightning is to have it be well grounded. So the ground wire will help remove the potential from the solar array. You still will install a lightning arrestor down at the bottom of the system on the DC side in order to protect the rest of the electronics in the event that the solar array is struck by lightning which you know, a direct hit, there's only so much you can do. You'll also put the lightning protection on the other side, on the AC side, to prevent 
nearby lightning strikes from surging up the power line and frying the electronics. So you will put a, a DC and an AC lightning suppressor on these systems. Now, oddly enough, on the AC side, if you're off grid, you're not connected to the grid, so you don't get those surge loads. The home run cables coming out of the array or a jumper cable from one array section to the other will require you to build your own solar cables up on the rooftop. You know, outside of conduit, up on the rooftop, the solar industry has its own cable, which is literally called PV cable or PV wire for photovoltaic. You know, PV wire has a very thick jacket, about as thick of a cable jacket as anything you've seen. A coaxial cable uh, and sometimes have an incredibly thick cable jacket with a little tiny piece of copper in it. This is like a much larger piece of copper with the same size thick cable jacket around it. So it's commonly rated for 1500 volts or 2000 volts. That thick jacket also gives it a rating for exposure to sunlight. You know, it has to be thick so it doesn't deteriorate. And it's common for solar installers to order spools of PV cable by the 500 foot spool uh, or even larger. Um, you know, if you know the distance between the array and the home run conductors, uh, like if you've planned your array layout and you know your PV cable, where the circuits are going to start, where they're going to stop, and where your transition box is, that is something you can pre-plan and pre-cut, although it is just, you know, most installers prefer the ease of just doing it live in the field. Uh, the thick cable jacket helps you if you're tugging on the solar cable, like dragging a wire through, uh, pulling a circuit through the, the rack, uh, while it's not a good practice and you should avoid dragging your cable across the metal rack uh, because the sharp edges of the metal racking system can cut in to your cable jacket, uh, while that's not a good thing that should be happening, you know, that extra thick jacket on the PV cable is very forgiving and makes you appreciative that you used it. It's the right cable for the job. Every solar job should have PV cable on it. So the solar cable is a high voltage, high temperature, you know, jacket that's wet rated and rated for being outside of conduit. And that is why it is such a robust cable. So one of the, the specialty tools for making up the ends of the cable is called an MC4 crimping tool for crimping on MC4 connectors to the ends of it. MC4 connectors are made by a manufacturer who opened up the design uh, for everyone to make. Therefore, it became the standard solar connector. Multiple manufacturers make it. Some Manufacturers make higher quality MC4 connectors than the actual MC4 company. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're similar. You know, the, the real danger with MC4 connectors is when you get into commercial, you want to make sure you're buying MC4 connectors that are rated for the higher voltage rather than the lower voltage, which I, I suspect was one of Tesla's problems. Is maybe they were installing... 600 volt MC4 connectors on 1000 volt systems. Uh, you can get an MC4 crimp tool on Amazon for about $30. That gets the job done. Um, there are more expensive MC4 crimp tools that'll go up to be $600 or more that result in uh, faster and more professional operations. So if you're an installer, you may have a, a better MC4 crimp tool than what you'll just find online. 
of MC4 connectors connect solar modules to solar modules. They're what's put on the, they come on the solar panel themselves. You're just making up the home run cables that go from the edge of the array back to your transition box or maybe all the way back to the inverter itself. Um, it's important to understand that even though these are all waterproof design, you know, devices designed to go outdoors, they only have their weather ratings once everything's all plugged up and plugged in. And so you should uh, take special care to protect your unplugged MC4 connectors, whether they be on your solar panels or your home run circuits or your module level panel electronics, from wind and rain and drooping down into puddles uh, when you are installing the system. So if you've mounted a bunch of electronics and a, a giant rainstorm blows up on you, you have all these open MC4 connectors exposed, you know, while they should be plugged up and sealed, at the very least, you want them all facing downwards so that the rainwater drips out of them rather than into them. Uh, you know, if you're if you're caught off guard. Uh, so MC4 connectors should not sit in water, even when plugged up, such as if they're installed on a commercial roof with ponding water. You know, they should be managed up off of the roof deck. Um, essentially, you strip off a bit of water, put it into the MC4 connector, and then this specialized tool crimps it down, and the housing screws on tight over it. Uh, it's It seems simple, but you have to take care. Uh, one common mistake I find is that installers just do not tighten up this back cable gland across the front of it, and sometimes the, the tightness of that gland uh, helps the, the cable to ca the MC4 to MC4 connector make. And sometimes I've found uh, that that's a source where the current can leak out of the connector and uh, screwing it up tight is, is important. And yeah, that's, so just, if you're making those, make sure you're doing a patient and good job because that is a failure point in the system. Uh, speaking of failure points in the system, you know, what we said is the, the, it's common for your racking layout to have staggered L feed. You know, this way we're hitting every single rafter. There's not a single rafter on this rooftop without an attachment in it. You know, that's better for even load distribution across the roof. Remember yesterday we said the corners of the array are subject to higher wind speed. And so it's a good idea on the court to give the corners of the array closer together reinforcement. So here, even if we are going four foot on center with most of our attachments, um, you know, giving those corners of the array additional reinforcement is a good, you know, I think kind of standard layout. Uh, so if you're doing your own racking attachment design and you want to get fancy with staggered attachments uh, you may be more conservative at the corners with your spacing before you start uh, expanding out towards the middle you know likewise if i have multiple rows of modules and multiple sticks of rail going on the roof in the interior of the solar array uh, i might get look at the racking spec, identify that it could take a six foot span instead of a four foot span and start going with a wider grouping on the very interior of the array, understanding that it's the corners and the edges of the array that are subject to greater uh, wind load. Now last, the last kind of above the manufacturer recommendation attachment point technique is for areas of heavy snow. Uh, such as areas where you get one foot of snow each year on your rooftop. So the weight of the snow sitting on top of a solar array will be distributed more at the bottom rail of the array than the top. 
And in areas like Buffalo, New York, that weight can be so great that it crushes the attachments through the roof deck. You know, so it's like pressing down on those rafters and the surface board between the rafter and the solar array can't take it anymore and the L feet kind of push through. So that can, you know, the way you, you take weight off of those L feet along the bottom row in areas of heavy snow is just to hit every single rafter as you're going across the rooftop. And when you're planning your array layout too, you want to consider aesthetics. You know, this is a, a, so we have a question. So how's the MC4 connector used within the rail? How is it protected from standing water within the rail? Um, so on the MC4 connectors, you are just making sure that they're clipped up uh, from the rail. Now on my U-channel rails, I will drill little holes through the rail so that any water in the rail can leak out of it. Yeah, you know, that's that's uh I'm not that probably is what you're asking is this is in the you know you have your your MC4 connector and if you use a U channel rail and you put it down in that U channel, you know what happens if you you get water in here? You know, that's ironically that's where like Unistrut, that's a slotted channel rail might be, you know, actually the best solar rack because Unistrut has you know, this wide use channel and the the slots would already give it, um, you know, so the, an ability not to retain water. Now, my rail is by and large uh, hidden underneath the solar array, so it's not getting much water in it to begin with. Um, you know, the, the real dangers I've seen with MC4 connectors with wet, have had them be in puddles on the rooftop. Uh, it might be during new construction on a commercial project where you your crew has gotten ahead of themselves uh, and has not done the cable management. But generally, you're not plugging in the home run cables until towards the end of the construction phase. So at the ends of the arrays, you know, maybe an installer left a cable dangling down on the roof and it's gotten into a puddle. In one of the Tesla Walmart fires, uh, there was a mention of MC4 connectors that, for whatever reason, maybe they were never cable managed to begin with. Maybe, maybe the cable management system failed, uh, drooping down onto the rooftop and landing in a puddle. You know, they they should not be they should not be submerged in water. Um. This design came to me from a developer, and you know, right off the bat, we can see it's a, a discontinuous solar array. So it would involve us building a jumper cable uh, between the two subarray sections. And it also doesn't look very nice. So you know, I kind of redesigned it to give it a more symmetrical layout. And we, we stayed a little bit further away. We actually moved it moved it down to stay further away from the windows. We did that for a few reasons. Uh, the upper part of this roof actually had a steeper tilt, which was not walkable. Um, it's also the upper part of this roof goes straight into the the, the kind of lofted cabin interior. So I didn't want lag screws kind of sticking through into their living room. Uh, whereas on this portion of the cabin, there's kind of a, a attic underneath. And, you know, this particular customer was constrained by uh, really going through a third party solar sales company. But uh, let's just say they were budget constrained. And... Um, you know, the redesign is continuous, and so that means we only need to have one junction box, which we ended up sticking underneath the array instead of two. And the array, you know, it just, it just looks much nicer than the, 
know, how the original design would have looked. I found it pretty interesting that this particular developer's designer was noting the, the worst case scenario tributary area uh, for rainwater runoff. And they're, they're making kind of the interesting note that if by and large in heavy rain, rain is hitting the surface of the module, it's going to be running off from one module to the next to the next, and then all kind of stacking up under a worst case tributary area. You know, my years of solar being on the roof with rainwater runoff start eroding, you know, the roof surface where all the water's cascading off the module. You know, maybe not on a metal roof like that, but on a shingle roof. You know, I don't know. I haven't seen it as an industry issue. I would not be surprised if people start getting worn out shingles uh, along the bottom of their solar array over the, the decades as the roof ages. Now, where I think about this issue is how to align the solar array along the bottom edge of this rooftop. And so what I do, and, and this is probably kind of a, a bad example because uh, this particular client, even though they probably need a gutter along the edge of the roof, they don't have one. And, uh, you know, in our case, we, we reduce the worst case tributary area because we don't have as many rows of modules for the rainwater to fall off, but whatever. Um, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take my modules and just start them along the bottom edge of the roof, still three feet off the sides, definitely three feet off the top. But I'll start right along the bottom edge of that rooftop uh, and, and give myself maybe a, an inch or two offset because the worst thing that could happen is that the rainwater falls off the modules and then skips over the gutter. And so, you know, I don't want to go right up to the edge of my array because I don't want torrential rainfall to miss the gutter. At the same time, I'm not, you know, trying to start my array further up the roof and then maybe develop a line uh, because of rainwater runoff over the years to come. Again, I don't know if that's a, a real issue or not, but looking at that call out of rainwater tributary areas on by this one designer started to make me think, well, maybe we need to start considering um, the long-term impact of concentrating all of the rainfall on the roof into one axis uh, or one under, you know, taking all the rain that would normally fall evenly across every course of shingles and then having it uh, just fall onto one row of shingles. You know, it's so on an aging roof where you're halfway through the roof life, you're going to face the decision whether to install on the existing roof and hope for a longer roof life or to re-roof. Now, again, while the solar array will protect the roof underneath it, the solar array doesn't cover the entire roof. And on a roof that's already showing signs of wear and tear, uh, the construction crew uh, could be even harder on that, you know, could do even more damage to that roof. So, you know, if, if you do have a mismatch between an old roof and a new solar array, uh, you know, think long and hard about putting a new course of, you know, taking all the shingles off and reshingling the roof from the ground up with a new solar array. Not that you have to, and not that's what, what is most people do, uh, and not that there isn't an argument to go the other way, to say, hey, if I'm only one third of the life or halfway through the life of my shingles, by better protecting them, I might get longer mileage out of them. You know, if uh, the southern, but generally you can tell by the time you're up on the roof or doing a solar side evaluation, if the shingles look like they're in, in bad shape or not. And generally the roof leaks that are associated with the solar array are going to make themselves apparent uh, within a, a month 
of the array being installed. Yeah, so, so this is the end result of the, the redesign where we've used internal cable runs so we don't see any ugly conduit going along the array perimeter. Uh, the racking has, in the racking specification manuals, gives a cantilever distance. So the last L-foot attachments on the system are located underneath the array along with the transition box. And so the array is kind of hanging over the last attachment point. We use a band saw to cut off the tips of the rail to kind of achieve this final aesthetic where the array looks like it's just magically hovering on the roof deck. Now, not only does that improve the looks of the system, which I think are essential to the property value that it adds, uh, but also the panels themselves are protecting those attachments from exposure to the elements. Now, utility scale uh, racking, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, just some other kinds of racking systems before we move into our design uh, discussion. You know, here's floating solar. It's a utility scale trend. What's interesting about uh, floating solar is uh, you know, wastewater treatment plants or stormwater facilities have kind of free real estate plus a heavy electrical load. And particularly with water treatment plants, um, you know, the, the solar array serves as a cap for the reservoir so they get less sunlight in the water, which means less algae bloom. Uh, so there's, there's some additional benefits to floating solar besides the free real estate. Um, although I would think that the degradation on these are, is going to be pretty substantial. Uh, here's a system designed for landfills, uh, which is kind of similar to com most commercial roofs where the array is weighted down by concrete blocks. Um, but this is kind of an above the ground concrete pour uh, for the event where you can't drill into the ground, whether it be incredibly rocky soil um, or, or uh, you know, a landfill cap. You know, here's kind of a, a lower profile system that's even better for, in particular, landfills because it's a completely plastic racking system uh, rather than metal, which could be exposed with gas. So maybe in a, a landfill, you want to do a, a frameless racking system with a plastic rack uh, to get rid of that metal entirely. There are systems out there which can accommodate that. Now, I'm not a fan of the traditional commercial solar rack, which is to put kind of these pans across the roof and fill them in with loose concrete blocks. I don't like how close the modules are to the roof deck. I've found that on many flat roofs, uh, the water does not make it all the way to the roof drain. Um, I just did a project where there was a levee around every single roof drain, and so they didn't work at all. And the entire roof would fill up with a couple of, like, I'm exaggerating, the entire roof would fill up with like an inch of water, uh, and the panels were only sitting you know, two inches above the roof deck, and, you know, that gives me the heebie-jeebies. And uh, the Dietz-Watson fire in particular, well, any fire, having a bunch of loose concrete across the rooftop is not a good idea, and, it, you know, if there's a fire in the building, it's not always going to be the solar rays' fault. Um... Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of, I'm going to come back to this. Oh, let me have a picture for it. Yeah, we're going to come back to this discussion later. Let's keep moving on. Uh, 
Yo, here's a um, you know the majority of utility scale projects are single axis trackers. So there's trackers that track the sun from east to west rather than from north to south. Um, you know, morning and evening production are particular valuable times of day for power generation for the utility market. Um, and so an east to west tracker is more valuable for utilities than north south, even when they're located up in the north part of the United States. Um, double axis trackers are less popular because they're more complicated in terms of their design and they require more real estate uh, than single axis trackers due to the amount of shadows that uh, a, a tilted up solar array uh, will cast. So the market has really shifted from no tracking to a majority tracking for utility scale over the last um, 10 years. Just the simple idea being that the performance boost is greater than the added cost of the tracking gear. Um, you know, for utility scale racks and even for residential ground mounts, the, the post-based foundations can require substantial depth to them unless you use a lot of posts. So utility scale ground mounts are generally a single post supporting the row of modules and they're driven with a, a pile driver down into the ground. So here's our, our single posts being hammered into the ground. And the residential level, you're usually not going to rent a pile driver. And so instead of having a single post, you have rows of posts. So the solar arrays supported by two rows of posts rather than one row of posts. Um, this is a helical pile, which has the ability to, you know, instead of drilling a hole into the ground, putting the post in and filling it in with concrete, the helical pile has a, a similar pull strength as a post secured by concrete. Now uh, the cost is about the same. Now to install your helical piles or ground screws, you generally need an upgraded uh, bobcat uh, laser level, you know, and kind of an experienced construction crew. But you do get rid of the concrete and the logistics associated with that. Uh, but the cost of adding this helical shape. Uh, to the post does drive up the cost to the point where it's about a wash whether or not you use ground screws versus concrete. Kind of depends on your soil type. Now here's a variation on the helical post called a ground screw uh, and this is particularly useful when your soil has uh, you know cobblestones and rocks in it uh, preventing you from sometimes being able to auger out uh, you know, your roofing surface very well. So if you have particularly rocky soil, you may opt for a ground screw. If you have, you know, good loamy, sandy, clayey soil, you may opt for a helical post uh, to get rid of the, the concrete. But the real only advantage of getting rid of the concrete is some, if, it's, if your project site is remote enough where getting concrete to it is, is difficult, some environmentalists are, are particularly opposed to concrete. It's useful to know that there are other mounting options available. You know, concrete, even when you're mixing your own concrete on site, just transporting the sheer weight of the concrete uh, can be problematic for a ground mount, which you know, takes a foundation's worth of concrete. Yeah, if you are on a single post system, the posts are commonly going seven feet into the ground. Uh, the exception being some utility scale single axis trackers are only stacking the modules one module high, and those have shallower foundations than the ones that go two modules high. Let's see. Uh, here's just some some different kinds of foundational techniques. 
you know, building a concrete form above the ground versus drilling down into the ground. Yeah, in this particular picture, they're saying, you know, drill your helical posts down into the ground and then level them off with a bandsaw. You know, I have found that you can be precise enough to use a laser level and avoid having to cut the pipe with a porter band. And when you think about the substructure to your racking, the single post system is better for landscaping and maintenance because you can actually get up underneath the solar array as opposed to when you have kind of a, a bleacher style rack, uh, which is a little bit less accessible. You know, single axis tracking is great because it makes lawn maintenance really easy. You can tilt your modules one way and then you can tilt them the other way. Well, it's kind of interesting that single axis trackers, you know, they have functional advantages. Uh, they also make better use of the structural component of the frame, providing some cantilever support for the modules, which is usually not kind of tested by uh, residential ground mounts. Um, so there's a little bit better use of material and you know the only real added cost for going from a fixed in place ground mount to a tracking ground mount is the cost of the little rotating uh pipe flange that goes on top of the post and then the motorized you know actuator or gear that drives the tracker and the control board and so it's kind of interesting that it dominates the utility scale market, but is almost non-existent at the residential level. Uh, at the residential level, installers generally opt to keep it simple. Uh, but there is kind of a misconception that tracking is not cost effective at the residential level. It's a really small market. And most of your residential single axis tracking companies from years past have now matured into companies that are targeting the utility scale level. And they really have, you know, if you're selling multi megawatt contracts, why deal with, you know, a couple of kilowatts of residential. And so it's mainly just that the single axis trackers are unavailable at the residential market. You know, it's a very short supply. You know, it's not to say that it, it could not be cost effective, you know, what I would say is it's not cost effective at the residential level uh, due to a lack of manufacturer support. There is one residential double axis tracker company in the U.S. out there selling systems and supporting systems. You know, personally, I think the double axis trackers have aesthetic similarities to satellite dishes of old. And I don't think it's a look that will age well, although the system owners, you know, do like seeing their solar array move around, you know, so maybe they look at it a little bit more as, as sculpture. Uh, you know, the, the dominant philosophy in residential uh, ground mounting is to keep it simple and to simply install more solar panels. Uh, but if you have a very limited area, like a small clearing in the middle of the woods, you know, a double axis tracker will make better use of that very specific space. But again, that market is so small, it doesn't attract a lot of manufacturer support. And so there's not a lot of product available. And what product is available is expensive. That doesn't mean if you build a do it yourself tracker, uh, you might be able to get better. Uh, function out of a system, particularly out of an off-grid system where you want summertime production and wintertime production. You know, tracking can make sense to you on that. That doesn't mean you're going to find a product on the market because it's not a very large market at this time. 
you know, furthermore, a well-designed off-grid system is should be filling up the batteries every single day. And so adding tracking to that is, you know, often just an issue of the batteries get filled up earlier. Um, but it's not, you know, you still with off-grid, once your batteries get full, any additional production is wasted. So at the utility scale level, every kilowatt hour that comes out of a tracking array is pumped into the grid and sold. Um, that's not necessarily true with a, an off-grid residential system. Well, that's not true with a residential off-grid system. So, you know, on-site inspection, benefits the design process process you know i'll get into the attic and measure the rafter spacing uh, that will help me plan out the project at site you know when i look at the rafter spacing i'll go back to my cad and plan the each location of every attachment before getting back on site so when i get up onto the roof I have a drawing of my staggered attachments and where they should go. It's a matter of just identifying the rafters and then fitting the design into it. You can only get that level of pre-planning if you have someone get into the attic and measure the rafter spacing uh, at the preliminary site evaluation. But even just having the client get into the attic and snap a photo can be revealing you know, here's the building drawings that are showing a very thin gauged steel, 29 gauge, uh, on top of what looks like two by four rafters or purlins on top of two by four rafters, and the site photo reveals it as such. And we have a question: Does so floating solar have any cease restrictions? Yes, there's there's actually parts of National Electric Code that target floating structures so you can build a, a code compliant floating solar array um you know here's uh the this picture is just showing that there are structural engineering companies that are specializing in stamping residential. So this is like one company kind of asking for what the, the load uh, bearing walls look like. Uh, adding hurricane clips is a standard uh, kind of item for you to look at on your site evaluation. If you get into an attic, and you don't see any kind of metal clips holding the truss to the building wall, you know, that's a, a good clue for you to bring in a structural engineer uh, you know, or better secure the rafter to that wall. If putting a lag screw into the rafter uh, does not sound like such a good idea, you know, one way, if you don't like the idea of missing, uh, when lag screwing into the rafter, you can double up on the thickness of that rafter by kind of uh, doddering um, you know, a smaller rafter right next to it and securing it to the rafter to give you just a little bit larger of a mounting area. Um, or you can run this you know, the opposite way you know, between two rafters uh, to sister it together, give it a little bit more reinforcement. Now, racking manufacturers will provide online design tools to assist you with the racking design. Um, boy, we're at our we're going to take a break in about three minutes or so. Well, racking manufacturers will often provide a design tool online to assist you uh, with designing. This particular racking company makes clamps for standing seam metal rooftops. Uh, or corrugated metal rooftops, brackets that screw into the rooftop. 
And so here they're they're showing for their particular brackets that screw into these purlins. I'll just ignore this picture. Uh, the the pull string. You say okay, or if you go into the decking, and give you 173 pounds of pull strength. If you go into the rafter, you're getting substantial, you know, two to three times as much pull strength, uh, depending on how you. Uh, orient the, you know, depending on if it's a, a purlin that's laid flat horizontally or a rafter that's up on its edge vertically, you know, or if you're just screwing into the steel roof. You know, what we saw previously was that the uh, steel roof was 29 gauge steel. You know, what this is telling us is our, our 29 gauge steel metal roof is too thin uh, for the attachments to work. They're giving us saying if you just want to screw straight into the metal, you need at least a 16 gauge steel for that. Um, you know, residential installers today prefer uh, rafting ba rafter based lag screws. So decking based systems where you're just screwing into the deck where you're not hitting the rafter, they're not as strong, and solar is a very long term upgrade. Uh, but there are specific instances where you might want a decking based racking system. What's interesting about this load profile is they're saying, you know, they're, they're giving you pull strength for just mounting into uh, the the cladding of the roof material, and you can find manufacturers that sell systems that just attach into the decking. That's not the standard practice, but you know, let's say you want to do solar on a trailer home, and it's a trailer where it's like a one foot deep attic, and that attic has been completely filled in with spray foam you may not be able to determine where the rafter is. And so at that point, planning around a decking-based system uh, would be the way to go. Now, for that matter, when you're clamping onto the roof using standing seam metal roof clips, uh, that in and of itself is a decking-based system uh, you know, where you're not lag screwing into the rafter. So often when you're using a decking-based racking system, you're simply using far more attachment points. And so I actually prefer, you know, an instance where I can take a screw and screw through the roof, even if it's a metal roof, to bite down onto that purlin securely and know I have a solid attachment rather than trust how the metal roofing panel is attached to the roof itself or rather than a system that screws just into the sheet metal. Um, you know, I, I vastly prefer a roofing profile where I can do a, a positive attachment. You know, the, the danger with uh, standing seam is that you know here we're looking at wind upload speeds for standing seam uh, based on different substrates that the seam is uh, you know attached to, and what we're showing is is based on you know the uh, the the span your load span table of twelve inch wide standing seams. Uh, all the way up to five inches, you know, basically you look at the load profile table and you look at your uh, load profile forces that we'll get from our racking software after the break. And what we'll realize is that, you know, on your metal roofing panels, you really have to attach to every standing seam in order to make sure that under your worst design scenario, that a high gust of wind doesn't rip the panel off of the, the, not just the solar array, but the standing seam metal panel off of the roof. So we're about to take our break, but I wanna bring it into one um, kind of final note, coming back to this concrete on commercial racking. 
And the standard is to fill in these ballast pans with concrete and just weight the array down on the roof deck. And, you know, the bottom edge of this module just sits an inch or two up off the roof deck. And then, you know, this is, this is a little bit further up. Uh, what I've done in the past that I really like, particularly after the project is done, is racking systems that are elevated up off the roof deck. And you might think, well, an elevated racking structure is going to increase the wind load. You know, we reduce the wind load, we reduce by making the array lighter. You know, the concrete with elevated racking structure isn't going to work. The load's going to be too big. Many buildings can't take the weight of the concrete to begin with. What's interesting about this kind of elevated system is the weight of the rack and the weight of the panels is enough to keep the array on the roof. What the concrete really does is prevent the array from sliding around on the rooftop. And so by cutting a hole in the roof, you know, bolting the attachment to the rafter, and then having the roofing contractor come and flash and seal the array, you know, that's a very waterproof seal around this attachment. And that prevents the you know, tangential forces from sl the array sliding around on the rooftop. And then uh, the weight of the array is enough such that only the corners of the array are anchored to the building. You know, the rest of it is up supported by pipe blocks. And so on, on an elevated racking system where you attach into the roof, you can get rid of all this loose concrete block stuff that's really a carryover from the satellite dish industry, which I don't think is, is the best. You know, there are certain buildings that are, are super strong, and the simplest solution is just to get up there with some concrete blocks and weight the solar array down. Um, I don't think that that's particularly appropriate for high occupancy buildings by penetrating through the roof and positively attaching to the roof truss, you can get rid of that concrete. It's just something to keep in mind. The standard commercial design practice is to use these concrete based systems. Uh, these are just examples of different kinds of fasteners that can upgrade the, uh, the, the strength of your rooftop. Uh, this picture came from a, a building technology website in Florida talking about what they do to get hurricane ratings onto their rooftops by gluing the truss together for additional strength. It's kind of a... Uh, so now that we've talked about racking components, the challenge becomes to convert the array layout our solar rectangles, which now fill up the interior of our roof, into a final bill of material. Uh, solar racking manufacturers want to make this process as easy as possible on the designer. So essentially, the array layout is replicated uh, within the manufacturer provided sizing tool uh, to not only generate some engineering data, but also give us uh, the final racking bill of material. Uh, so what we've done in this layout is done a, a landscape layout, and sometimes landscape can uh, fit more panels on the roof than portrait. Uh, I know companies that'll do landscape running the rail up the roof, even though that's um, kind of difficult because of rafter spacing. I know others that say, you know what, we're just going to use you know, instead of running our rail along the, the short end of the module, we're going to run our rail along the long end of the module. Anyway, we've taken the array layout and we've replicated it in the commercial design software. Another way to do it is not so visually where we're converting the array layout into groups of you know columns and rows you know into little sub arrays even though the array itself may be continuous or contiguous uh the we divide it into little sub array sections you know, so 
Here we have, you know, two rows of three modules. Here we have two rows of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten modules. You know, we break that out into uh, the design software. Now, on your racking design software, uh, you'll be asked uh, to provide building details. You know, environmental conditions, what's the local wind speed, what's the local snow load, uh, what's the exposure category. This particular software goes even further to say what's your purlin spacing or rafter spacing. So a lot of the manufacturer provided softwares turn out to be pretty fully featured solar design softwares that, you know, are free to use, but they're specific to one particular manufacturer. There's some different engineering data. Now at the end, the array layout and building information is inputted, and this is saying, okay, let's use the XR10 or XR100 or XR1000 racking system. And in zone one, which is the interior of the array, or zone two, that's the edges of the array, or zone four, which is the corners actually of the roof rather than the array. Um, it's telling us the maximum span that we can have between attachment points. And so in zone three, it says we can have up to a four foot span, whereas in the interior of the roof, uh, we could have a five foot span. If we upgrade into a more robust rail, these spans between rails become wider and wider. Of course, the question becomes, do we need a 10 foot span? Because if we're trying to attach to every single rafter, you know, maybe that span length is really much more than what we need. So we can save some money by going down with a, a weaker rail. It'll also tell us things like the cantilever distance. And so if I'm all going all the way to the corner of the rooftop, the last attachment point needs to be, you know, no more than one foot nine inches from the edge of the array perimeter uh, so that it can be tucked underneath the array rather than ex extend out of the array perimeter. So it'll tell you your cantilever distance if you're trying to keep all of your attachment points tucked up underneath the array. And we see that that distance is usually over a foot, you know, over 18 inches. Normally, your last attachment point, well, as long as you're you know, a foot from the edge of the array, you're going to be just fine. I'll find whatever last rafter is there. Is it, whichever rafter is the last rafter inside your array perimeter is going to be just fine uh, in most cases. And even in, in, if you're not all the way to the edge of the roof, if the rafter, the last rafter is right at your array perimeter, going, you know, 16 inches over is still going to be within the cantilever distance. You know, the L-foot attachment that's screwed into the roof is supported by the lag screw. Um, the manufacturer software is telling us the uh, downward, you know, uplift and tangential forces that are placed on that particular attachment. So they're saying if we're in zone, you know, three, the corner of the roof, that increased wind speed is going to give us more uplift than at the edge of the roof. And this is where I think it's interesting. You combine this data with, you know, let's say you designed this racking system, but it's a metal roof. So you have to add the, you know, metal roofing attachments to it. And we go and we look at the metal roofing attachments and we say, okay, you know, if we're, if we're attaching just to the decking, we have a pull strength of 177 pounds. If we're attaching to a purlin or a rafter, we have a pull strength of 400 to 600 pounds. We go back into our racking design software, and it's telling us our uplift strength. Look, if we're at the corner of the array in zone three, the uplift strength is 330 pounds. That's greater than the pull strength of 
using a decking-based racking system where we're going into the decking and not the purlin. Whereas the pull strength, if we're in the interior of the array, is within the limits of that, it was like 170 foot pull strength of a decking based racking system after the safety factor is applied. So installers who are doubtful of decking based racking systems have every right to be because if they went all the way to the corner of the roof or the edge of the roof, you know, the decking based racking systems could pull out of the roof. Whereas if you stuck to the interior of the roof, the decking based racking systems would be fine. It's kind of like right on the edge of that, you know, what's allowable. You know, we've already applied our safety factors and now we're right on that limit. You know, so if you're using, if you're not screwing into the rafters or purlins, then absolutely you should not be mounting at the edges or corners of the roof. Now, how do you reduce those forces on the attachment points? You, know, you use more attachments rather than less attachments. And so after we've gone through this process, after we've, we've put our array layout into the racking software, answered some environmental conditions, and then went and, and even told it what's our desired spacing between the rafters or purlins, the output is this engineering data. And the output is also a complete bounce of system material list for the racking components. So here is our our rail, sticks of rail, here's our grounding clips, here's our end clamps. You know, any, if the rail is too short, we need to splice rail together, here you go. You know, if you need to continue your grounding from the rail to rail splice, here's you go. You know, the, the grounding lugs and all the hardware are included and in this particular example, even priced out for you all ready to order. Usually that's going to be at, at like retail pricing and not installer pricing. So you go through a, a you know, a, a distributor, present yourself professionally. It's not going to be 36 cents a watt. It's going to be less than that. But anyway, here you go. If you're interested in how to convert an array layout into sticks of rail, in clamps and mid clamps, you use the manufacturer sizing software. Let's talk about how we do that with uh, inverters. Now remember that the solar cell is packaged into modules and the modules are pack packaged into circuits and the solar industry calls those DC circuits strings. And so when you plug these multiple circuits into an inverter, you're using what's called a, a string inverter, which is a, a circuit level inverter. The other two kinds of inverters are in a category called module level panel electronics, and they're comprised of micro inverters, which came to the market first, where you're putting an inverter behind every single panel on the roof as if every single panel was its own independent system. And then there's a, a compromise approach where you're only putting about half of the inverter on the roof. It just stays DC to DC. And then you're still using a central inverter, a string inverter down on the ground to convert all of the DC into AC. And so you get some of the, you know, buying a bunch of small things is more expensive than buying one big thing. So string inverters are cheaper than micro inverters. Now half of your system is microinverters and half of your system is a string inverter. It ends up, it's still costing along the lines of microinverters, but it's a little bit less. So installers who are always seeking the most cost optimal application, you know, are, are migrating towards the, the DC optimizer system. The string level system doesn't have that module level control. And for a, a various reasons, that's making the string inverter system by itself less and less popular. You know, the, originally these module level boxes were invented for shade mitigation. So 
So if one panel on a string inverter system becomes shaded, it can have an impact across the entire circuit. Now, generally, a shaded solar panel, you're not talking about one bypass section of the module, but even if you were, that shadow moving across the array causes the array voltage to jump up and down. The array voltage jumps up and down, the inverter gets confused, and it, it stops tracking efficiently. And that's just for a shadow moving across the array. A shadow that's staying on the array, if it covers one panel, it blocks that entire circuit. If it doesn't block the entire circuit, it only blocks partial of the circuit, you get the voltage jumping around, which isn't particularly good either. So, you know, basically shade on traditional solar arrays was to be avoided like the Black Death. And so DC optimizers or microinverters came around and allowed every module to function independently of each other, meaning that a shaded solar panel would no longer shut down the entire system. Uh, and that also means you could put your array into more surface area on the system uh, because a, you know, a shadow that's on one panel for a couple hours of the day is not the concern. The concern is how that one shaded solar panel for a couple hours a day impacts the rest of the system. So now you can get a little bit closer to that chimney that casts a sundial-like shadow across the rooftop. You can get a little closer to the tree line that might shade the bottom row of panels uh, during the month of December, but otherwise give you 11 months out of the year worth of production. Not that that particular section of the roof is ideal for solar, but you know, if it's a question between doing a two pallet system and having some of the modules be shaded versus busting the pallet open and having a completely unshaded array, uh, the two pallet system and accepting a little bit of shade is gonna be the you know, more aesthetically pleasing, give you a little bit more power, and not cost substantially more because after all, you're really just buying a couple more solar panels. You're not buying, you know, everything else. Slightly larger array does not double every single cost item on the project. So which is better? Are microinverters better or DC optimizers better? You know, microinverters came to market first and so, you know, before 2010, Enphase was not on the market, and they quickly carved out a, a healthy portion of the residential marketplace. But then we see in, in green and blue uh, the DC optimizers coming to market, and they now comprise a larger market share than the microinverters. You know, meanwhile, string inverters continue to be used You know, here's here's some uh, you know they're they're still string level inverters, but they these are kind of like micro inverters for commercial systems. You know where you can find uh, and locate the inverters up on the roof. And here's a picture of the micro inverters installed on the rail. You know, ready for the modules to be installed. The National Electric Code says that any conductors outside of the array perimeter, and this perimeter has become more and more conservative. It used to be a six-foot perimeter, which would kind of cover the whole array. Now it's a one-foot perimeter, and so little modules that are hanging out on all by themselves are kind of like their own island. The National Electric Code says any conductors outside this one-foot array perimeter have to be able to be de-energized during, you know, on request. The uh, building's on fire. The fire department wants to kill power to solar, but they also want to kill, you know, the, the conductive power between the array and the inverter. 
and the uh, the definitions of that process become are becoming increasingly more strict whereas where you know most of the industry believes that the current version of code is essentially mandating that either module level power optimizers or module level microinverters be put behind every single panel. Now, if you're building a jumper cable from one subsection to the other, it's clear as day that the jumper cable has to be de-energized during a power outage. And so the only good way to do that is through, you know, inline voltage regulators. You know, there's a less conservative reading of the code that says, no, as long as all the conductors outside the one foot perimeter de-energize, that's sufficient. So if I had a completely continuous array, one that, that filled up the whole roof without any gaps, I could still get away with doing string inverters. Now the debate goes, is, comes down to that, you know, basically the array has to have string op has to have microinverters or DC optimizers unless it is field labeled as a shutdown, rapid shutdown array. So optimizers or microinverters inherently have rapid shutdown capability. When they turn off, it kills the power right at the module. So they do not need to be labeled or listed as rapid shutdown devices. Now, the most recent version of code says uh, if you're not using microinverters or module level panel electronics, then the array has to kill power within one foot and it has to be either listed or field labeled as a rapid shutdown system. Because there's no really manufacturer out there selling a complete rapid shutdown system, a strict reading of code would imply that you can't qualify for that definition. Whereas the code also says field labeled rather than listed. So a uh, uh, you know, more open interpretation of code would be to say, no, you can use you know, a, a junction box that disconnects the circuits for the array as long as you are labeling that in the field so that the fire department understands what's going on. And that, that would qualify for you just shutting down this one foot perimeter rather than at the module itself. You know, other installers say, well, you know, it's just gonna get more strict. So we're just gonna have any rooftop array have these module level boxes. And so these module level boxes provide shade mitigation. So they should really always be used on rooftops that have any amount of shade on them. Um, on the ground mount, if I have an unshaded ground mount, I'm using a string inverter because they're still good quality and they're less expensive. Uh, on a rooftop, I'm probably using module level panel electronics the only caveat being is that if it's a very inaccessible rooftop where I never want to get on that roof again, then I might put a, a, a rapid shutdown box that has individual string circuit level controls. I might actually put that rapid shutdown box in the attic right underneath the array and still claim that the, sh the box is within a one foot perimeter of the array in any direction. If I put it right underneath the array in the attic, run my cables into the attic, you know, my, my circuit power is still gonna be killed right at the array. This is a more specialized box made by that same Solideck company we were looking at earlier. And so again, the, the problem with rapid shutdown is wanting to de-energize that home run circuit. And then the, the future problem that installers are, are reading the tea leaves of code and saying code is almost banning that in NEC 2017. And so they're going to move towards it in the future is banning the high voltage circuit that would inevitably exist within the array perimeter even when the power is off 
without putting these little boxes that regulate the voltage in line um, at each solar panel. And so the, the short of it is that string inverters with smart combiners are the cheapest solution, but in a sense, they're the most difficult because now you have to figure out how are you going to wire the smart combiner box to the inverter. You know, whereas all that functionality is just built into, and that's that's not so hard. Usually you're running either a, a just a blank signal wire up to the rooftop or an Ethernet cable, but you still have to do the programming. Whereas the microinverters or DC optimizers have that kind of built in. Now the DC optimizers are actually um, closer to about 26 cents a watt. And the AC microinverters are closer to, you know, 40 cents per watt. And so, you know, the, the, the functions and ease of installation go up with spending more money on material. And that, that cost increase can translate into some, some payback increased system payback. So where all this, this circuit design stuff is going is saying, okay, well, we have our solar on our roof now, and that's generally a high voltage circuit. You know, we have batteries coming to market, and often these batteries are at a 48 volt standard, but the brand newer lithium ion batteries are going up to a higher voltage standard, which may be around you know, 380 volts. You know, we need the ability to, to shut off the, the module up on the rooftop. So we either need module level panel electronics or some kind of disconnecting junction box up on the rooftop. And there's even startups out there, in this case, PICA, that's trying to provide a little bit of everything. Say, you know what, we're not going to do module level electronics. We're going to do a string level optimizer. And that string level is going to bring us down to a high voltage battery. And we're going to put our modules and batteries all at the same voltage. You know, converting voltage from 600 volts down to 48 volts takes a lot more controlled and converting voltage from 400 volts down to 350 volts. And so, you know, having high voltage solar and low voltage batteries and, you know, 120 volt electric service, it, you get a bunch of voltage jumping around. That's going to reduce a lot of, create a lot of efficiency loss. And so there, there is a trend towards going towards higher voltage battery banks than your standard you know, 48 volt lead acid. Let's see, this is a, a line diagram that shows a, a battery inverter combined with a solar inverter in parallel, as well as a transfer switch between a grid and the generator. And then uh, you know, a transformer, this battery inverter is only a, a, a 120 volt inverter. And here we have it on a, a 240 volt solar inverter along with a transformer. So the home's fed with 120, 240 split phase. Often you'll just get two battery inverters. If the battery inverter is only 120 volts, you get two of them to get that 240 volt service. But kind of uh, coming back to uh, more simple batteryless design. And we cover battery design in a dedicated off-grid class, but we're still covering the basics. How do you determine from your array layout how many circuits go into the inverter? How many modules fit on each circuit? The total number of circuits? 
Well, just like the racking companies have racking sizing softwares, your inverter companies have what, what they call string sizing softwares or circuit sizing softwares uh, to match your modules to your output. So uh, in this case, this is a SMA example. SMA makes a string inverter. They don't make module DC optimizers. Well, I guess they they now do. They've partnered with a third-party manufacturer to meet rapid shutdown requirements. Now, SMA has a pretty good quality reputation. They have an interesting feature on their inverter, which is they their inverters have the ability to output a dedicated power plug, power supply, without batteries during the day only. So they, they throttle back the amount of power the system can produce and run it on a dedicated output circuit, which some installers say is a gimmick because it only works during the day. You know, others say, well, if you don't have any batteries and you're out of power and you have solar, even having a plug during the power outage that only works during the day is better than nothing at all. Now, anyway, this... Uh, particular inverter has a new feature as multiple PowerPoint trackers. So this inverter accepts up to two circuits per PowerPoint tracker. So it could hold up to four circuits. What's interesting about the PowerPoint trackers is they're like independent systems. So every microinverter is its own PowerPoint tracker. Every DC optimizer is its own PowerPoint tracker. Yeah, the problem with string inverters and why they were so shade unfriendly is they only had one PowerPoint tracker for the entire system. So if you got any sort of mismatch between circuit voltages, the inverter would get confused and turned off. But now string inverters have caught up and many have one, two, three, four, you know, multiple PowerPoint trackers. And this means on the same string inverter, you could have an east facing array and a west facing array, which is something relatively new. You know, that in 10 years ago, all the modules had to face the same angle and orientation on string inverters. Now there's a little bit more flexibility with that. And so on your string sizing tools, you're going to already know what module you're using because you've already done the array layout. You already know you're looking for an inverter that's about 85% the capacity of the list rating of the modules because of heat degradation, reducing the, the output during your most productive times of year. We saw that with PV watts, the maximum production getting up to being about 85% of the sticker rating. And so if we've picked out our module, and we've done our array layout, we know our array size, and we know our approximate uh, inverter size, it's really just a question of determining which modules go on which circuits. It used to be that you had to have the same number of modules on the same number of circuits. You know, now that's been divided between your PowerPoint. So I could have like two circuits of 10 and then one circuit of seven if that fits my particular design. You know, if I have a 26 module system, I could do two circuits of 10 and one circuit of six. Or I could do, you know, two circuits of six. I guess 25 is kind of hard to divide up. I could do two, you know, two circuits of eight and then a circuit of, of seven. You know, so what the string sizing software will tell you is all the possible configurations between modules. Let's do a, a real-time example. And here's a, a different inverter company called Fronius. And we're opening up their sizing tool.
And let's let's just say for grins, I bought one pallet of solar modules. And it was a 25 solar panel system. And let's also say for grins that these were 300 watt solar panels. So we have a seven and a half kilowatt array. And I'm looking for an inverter that's about 85% the size of that. I'm looking for around a 6.37 kilowatt inverter. And here's where we're doing our temperature correction by putting in our, our code driven, local code driven uh, design temperature. And for ambient, I'm kind of designing one for the southern United States. Remember, I'm looking for about a, a 6.3 kilowatt inverter. And so here I'm looking at you know, 120, 120, 240 service. Miss something? Well, yeah, single phase. Okay, so these are all. I have a, a 3.8 kilowatt option, a 5 kilowatt option, a 6 kilowatt option, or a 7.6 kilowatt option. So, you know, I'm looking for a 6.35 kilowatt option, all the way up to 25 panels times 300 watts is 7.5, and so. You know, I'm either going to choose the six kilowatt inverter or the seven kilowatt inverter. You know, it's it's not going to be a, a huge deal either way. Um, since I'm not using module level panel electronics, I know I'm going to have shade losses in addition to heat losses. So I'm going to err on the, the undersized inverter. 600 volt system. It's asking me for some racking information. Let's just use a, a popular uh, solar module. And we went and used a 300 watt solar panel. It's pulling in all that information from the spec sheets. And so really all I'm looking for is if my 25 module array layout is gonna work and I can see I can do, you know, two, it, it gives me, you know, ranges to, to operate in optimally. And so, you know, I can do one circuit of 13 and then one circuit of 12. You know, as these options jump around, my different configurations change based on what I'm actually trying to do. You know, it was a, a 12 and a 13 says, okay, well, you know, we're allowing you to oversize the array. The array is slightly oversized, but it's still within the parameters of our system. So you're gonna have your system work functionally fine. So you kind of use your array layout plus the string sizing to determine what your final circuits are gonna look like. You know, here we are doing the solar edge system using these kind of weird SIGs panels and these copper indium gallium selenium panels. They have much higher voltages and much lower amperages than a standard solar module, but it doesn't matter. Even these oddball solar panels are in the inverter string sizing software. So we've said, okay, we have a, a system layout where we have 132 solar panels on an 18 degree 412 tilt facing due south using these thin film modules and in the string sizing tool. You know, the one thing is we don't know what power optimizer we're using. This is an oddball solar panel. Uh, while it's telling us, okay, you're gonna use the P405 optimizer. All right, well, we don't have to worry about that. And then as far as the inverters go, you know, we're, we're doing a 150 watt panel and we're doing uh, 132 modules. This is a 19.8 kilowatt array. And what SolarEdge is, is telling us is they're giving us uh, a three inverter option at six kilowatts each. And what they're kind of telling us is just go ahead and even though you know, you're, you're not undersizing the inverter, just go ahead and do two 10 kilowatt inverters. That's the, the best 
you know, that's our recommended design. But you could do three six kilowatts. But what Solar Edge is basically saying is, you know, two of our 10 kilowatt inverters are going to cost about the same as three of our six kilowatt inverters. So just go ahead and oversize the inverter. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Now, I'd say with the SIGS modules, they have less uh, performance degradation due to heat. And so you would undersize them less. Uh, when you're using module level optimizers, you don't have the losses associated with mismatch and shade. And so uh, you would undersize less. And so particularly when using uh, DC optimizer systems, you, you want to err on the side of undersizing the inverter on the underside of a 15% deduction, whereas down in the south, using a string inverter, where you're going to get a lot of heat degradation, you could get an undersize on your inverter by, you know, 30% if you wanted to. Now, maybe this was a, a more critical design issue when uh, these electronics were much more expensive, but it's not unusual to have the inverter be slightly undersized compared to the array. So lastly, you know, a lot of solar designers will do the array layout, throw it into the string sizing, they throw it into the racking and say, okay, I know my racking balance of system. I know my, uh, how many circuits I'm going to have and which inverter it's going to work on. I'm ready to buy the material and send it off to the installer. One design step that I think is worth picking out is once we know that we have like one circuit of, of 12 modules and another circuit of eight modules or two circuits of 13 modules, you know, it, it is beneficial to think about, well, how is that going to lay out on a rooftop? So here I got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 modules. Yeah, I have two circuits of 17 modules right here. It makes a lot more sense to start here and move across the rooftop and, and end here rather than snake the circuit through. You know, if, if, if I have a circuit of 12 and a circuit of 8, it makes sense for me to put these on the same circuit and these on their own circuit rather than to divide it down the middle. You know, I like thinking about having logical array layouts. You know, a common approach to circuit design is what I would call snakes in a basket, where you just start here and you kind of go to your next door neighbor until you get to the end of the circuit. And then, um, you know, you end the circuit and then you start a new circuit. And this is going to give you kind of the most compact system design with the fewest number of circuits. And so if you're kind of a design optimization nut and you say, okay, well, there'll be less material with fewer circuits and less stuff to do with fewer circuits. So the least amount of circuits is going to be the, the most cost effective design. Well, yeah, but then another installer comes to the site 10 years later to service the array and they have no clue where the circuits are going to start or where the circuits are going to stop. And so, you know, particularly now that we have the flexibility to have multiple PowerPoint trackers with string inverters that allow us to do different sizes of circuits, or particularly the micro inverter and solar edge systems where because we have module level panel electronics, the circuits become much more flexible. You know, what I'll generally do with my circuits is instead of the, the snakes in a basket approach where you're just starting and stopping and clicking into your next door neighbor, what I like to do is start my circuit at the edge of the array and if I can carry it through all the way in a nice kind of straight and even and logical format. And so even though this might mean I do one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, if I do seven circuits of, 
if I do this is this is uh, seventy seven modules right here. Yeah, so if I do seven circuits of eleven, that's really you know clear and straightforward. If I had instead, I don't know if this if it was a, a seventy. Yeah, so seven circuits of eleven is kind of a bad example. Let's say if I had you know seven circuits of ten, I could do seven circuits of ten modules each, or I could do six circuits of I guess that doesn't doesn't quite work, but you get the idea is that sometimes with a snakes in a basket circuit layout, you can get away with a fewer number of circuits, but it's much better to do one or two more circuits and have the circuits be in clear, logical layouts uh, rather than anything else. I mean, yes, giving a, a circuit diagram to an installer so that they can see where all the circuits start and stop is a very useful, if not essential document to have as a deliverable. Uh, at the same time, it would be nice for an uh, experienced installer to be able to look at a solar array layout and uh, be able to, to make a guess as to where the circuits actually started and stopped. So, you know, think about your circuit diagrams not just being what's the least number of circuits I can do, but also what would make logical sense during um, an array layout. Okay. The design that's printed presented on this slide This document is 100% computer generated. So in fact, uh, performing electrical calculations by using computer software is probably more reliable than leaving those calculations to be performed by hand prone to human error. You know, knowing code is essential to performing solar design. And so, you know, using computers to generate code reports, uh, you know, could be a crutch, but by and large, there's so many calculations to make that, you know, I'd rather leave it to uh, professional software not to make, you know, mistakes. So what's interesting in this design, they're, they're calculating almost everything. They're calculating the, the size of the ground wire. They're calculating the, uh, the size of the conduit uh, that's based off a of conduit fill factor for the wires. They're calculating the max amperage and the wire gauge. Even this, this one line diagram here is computer generated not drawn out by hand. Now, sometimes the one-line diagrams that the computer solar software will generate are incomplete. So there is a, a especially with batteries coming back into play, a lot of the design softwares do not have their automated designs up to snuff to handle batteries. And so you might do a batteryless solar design using solar design software and then export the drawing to CAD to finish it out. Uh, but all these calculations are performed in solar design software and they're all a function of National Electric Code. So you know, just like with the manufacturer software, if you pick out your module, that provides all the, the inputs and then code drives everything from your conduit size you know, on out. Now, so this particular software is called Solar Design Tool, uh, and they at least used to do a 30-day free trial. I don't know about today because um, they recently changed their, their company name like in the last day or two. And it's a good residential software. I think Solar Design Tool is pretty unique because it goes further into providing actual National Electric Code reports calculating things like conduit fill and rated amperage, 
overcurrent protection sizing, even making a stab at generating a material list for your installation that is almost the same as what you would provide to an electrical distributor for quote. So when interconnecting the array, you're faced with two options. Are you going to do a, a supply side connection? Or are you going to do a load side connection? Are you going to land the solar array on the load side of the breaker or on the customer side of the meter, but the utility side of the breaker? So what's the difference? Well, am I going to land the solar panel on my electric service panel or am I going to land the solar array, you know, on the outside of the building before the power goes into the main panel? Now, if I keep the interconnection on the outside of the building, then I don't have to bring the inspector on the inside of the building to see all the other stuff that's going on in that control room. Uh, then again, connecting to the load side breaker is very easy. It requires less coordination with the utility, less scheduling. Um, it becomes a question of how much is allowed. And so the, the basic side of it is if you're doing a load side interconnection, you can get up to 20% extra amperage out of your service panel. Only in the limited circumstance where you're connecting to the very bottom of the bus bar. If you're connecting in the middle of the bus bar, you don't get this allowance, but that's very unusual for residential. Now, it's common to have a 200 amp electric service panel. And this is confusing because on a 200 amp electric service panel, you'll often have more than 200 amps worth of breakers. So how does the panel not draw? If you have 300 amps worth of load on a service panel, how does it not draw 300 amps? Well, it's limited by the main breaker that's rated for 200 amps. So not all the circuits on this panel are powered on at the main so at the same time. But if we had 300 amps of circuits all powered on the same time, it would trip this 200 amp breaker. So under no circumstances could this panel pull more than 200 amps of power through it because it has a 200 amp breaker. And since it's a 200 amp panel, it's a 200 amp breaker, it's sized appropriately. Well, now we're putting solar onto the load side. And so I can pull the amperage from the grid plus the amperage from the solar. And so it might be possible to pull 300 amps of load through a 200 amp panel. This is a rare circumstance where code is being friendly and being flexible because they're saying as long as your two power supplies are feeding opposite ends of the metal bar that connects them together, we will give you an additional 20% capacity out of that bus bar. So on a 200 amp bus bar, you could have 200 amps coming in from the grid and up to 40 amps coming in from the array. Or you could have a, a downsized breaker and have 180 amps coming from the grid and a 60 amp solar array. If you connect to the supply side, you aren't limited by that 20% amperage limit by a 40 amp or 60 amp array. On a supply side connection, you can do up to 100%. Because under no circumstance can you pull more than 100% of power through that main breaker. And so you can attach a 200 amp solar array onto this 200 amp rated conductor 
because it's constrained by this 200 amp breaker. So larger solar arrays are done on supply side connections. Smaller solar arrays are done as load side connections, you know, which is better is often a matter of your project. You know, on, on this particular project, I wanted to keep the inspector out of the control room, and it was a, a simple matter of getting the, you know, even before the project, this was a business. You know, we don't want to deal with uh, the power going out on a business. So when I have power going out on a customer, it's annoying. It's not what we want. It stresses me out. But they're not losing their revenue like a business would. This is a building where the business, it's nine to five. They're working every day during the week. And if they lose power, they lose money. And so what we had is the uh, electrical contractor came out on a weekend before the project and they just swipped, swapped out one of these LBs with a larger junction box. And so all they did that weekend was have the utility come out, power down the building, pull the conductors out of the box, put this larger junction box here where there used to be an LB, and then put the conductors back into the building. So the conductors came up from the bottom of the box and went back in to the building. Here is our solar array equipment. Here's our knife switch disconnect. Here's our service panel. And we are tapped as a supply side connection between the main breaker and the meter. And so to do that, we powered down the building for a minute and then we use these tap connectors that are called pierced insulating tap connectors uh, which are more expensive than your traditional tap connectors and electricians prefer traditional tap connectors mainly because they're reusable. These pierced insulating tap connectors are, are one-time use only so you better uh, have other kinds of switches and disconnects uh, managed to manage them, which we did in this case. We have that knife switch disconnect and we have breakers on the service panel. And so we powered down the building, opened up this junction box, and then cranked down on these tap connectors to splice the, the cable coming in from our solar array to the feeders that were between the meter and the main building. And so in, in this strategy, we could have interconnected our solar arrays down to the bottom of the bus bar. It was within that 20% 20, that 20 limit, uh, but we didn't have the spacing, and we didn't want to clean up the rest of the electrical room. So it was just easier to stay outside the building. Sometimes that's the, the only reason you need to do a supply-side connection. Usually a load-side collection at 20 to 40% is not going to be a large enough array to take you off grid or to offset 100% of your electric bill if you happen to have net metering. So smaller arrays are generally done on load side connections. Larger arrays are usually done on supply side connections. You, know, you still need overcurrent protection, whether it be a fuse or a breaker they're still the same thing. You know, they if they'll trip or blow if too much current is pulled through it. And so you'll get a unfused knife switch when you're landing on a breaker, or you'll get a fused knife switch if you're landing directly onto the inverter itself after that. You know, when you use a string inverter system, you're going to have a lot more equipment mounted on the side of the building. A microinverter system, you know, often your local jurisdiction will come in and require an external knife disc 
connect switch on the side of the building. Technically, a breaker in your, you know, in a on a service panel is a disconnect switch. Now, this utilities will go above and beyond electric code to require a knife switch disconnect. It's common, but not all utilities require the knife switch disconnect because it it is just one more access point for someone to stick their hand inside a system and hurt themselves. You know, usually when you open up the knife switch, it doesn't have like a protective plate in front of it like a service panel would. So if you're just very space constrained, if your gas line or your water line make it impossible for you to put a string inverter right where it needs to go, you might use microinverters to keep all the equipment up on the roof. So for a load or supply side connection, what protects the worker during a power outage? Every single grid tied inverter has a five minute delay from when the power goes out to when the power comes back on to when the solar array turns back on. So grid tied solar arrays lose power when there's a power outage and they do not turn back on until the grid comes back online. And that's not a very uh, well known feature for most solar customers. They think they're buying the solar array. If the power goes out, they're gonna have power. But it's actually, that's a much more costly proposition uh, what you would have to do to have your solar array power your facility during a blackout is instead of just having a tap connection, you would need an automatic transfer switch, which is a few thousand dollars. And then on top of that, you would need a battery, which might be plugged into the inverter or might be on its own inverter. And the batteries are the most expensive components. That's why most solar today does not have batteries is as a cost cutting measure. And so you really have to determine why are you doing solar? Are you doing solar purely for economic reasons? At which point you will usually not have a battery and you will usually need a net metering policy. Or are you doing solar to have backup power? You, know, you don't go and buy a generator for your house for economic reasons. You do it because you want backup power. Maybe there's some value you can put on not having the food in your home, you know, defall in the deep freeze, but you know, that's not like a dollars and cents economic payback for most solar buyers. Some commercial, sure. Um, what's interesting about off-grid inverters is as soon as you turn them on, they turn on. It's kind of liberating not to have to wait for those five minutes. So this is another solar design tool, one line diagram that was completely uh, made by hand. Now we've talked about smart combiner boxes and cable clips. So in the interest of time, we're gonna just keep going. You know, here's a, a pl plumbing vent solar add-on that's designed for uh, these, these are actually bad pictures. What they recommend is to take the plumbing vent and re-plumb it to be up out the, the top of the solar array so that you can get a, a you don't have to have an ugly gap in the middle of the array. You can fit more modules onto it. And I recommend that. I don't think having plumbing vents uh, in the middle of your array looks very good. I don't even know that you necessarily need a specialized part to re-plumb that plumbing vent so long as it keeps going up. You know, the point of a plumbing vent on a rooftop is to diffuse any gas into the air. And the reason why it sticks up off of the rooftop is to actually get that gas to diffuse instead of that gas collecting and rolling back down the surface of the roof and maybe into an open window below. So you can't just give your plumbing event a haircut and go over the top of it. You know, a lot of people think the height of that plumbing bin is for snow. And to some extent that's true. You don't want your snowpack blocking the vent, 
but that height of the vent is also there to help with the diffusion of the sewer, sewer gas. So coming back to this design we saw at the beginning of class yesterday, you know, replumbing that, that vent to go up and out the top would have preserved the original intent of this design, made it look better. You know, now it's a little bit more of a pinch to kind of walk around that solar array. So they thought they were keeping it nice and accessible, and then that field design change uh, threw them a curveball a little bit. Now, absent net metering, there are some small things you can do for load shifting. You could buy two deep freezes instead of one and fill half the freezer with jugs of water. And so you run the, the freezers during the day and you let them coast at night and take load off of that battery. You know, Solar Edge, the DC optimizer company, makes a heating element to go inside water tanks that is communicates with uh, energy meter to say, okay, if the grid, if the solar array is outflowing energy onto the grid, heat hot water instead. Well, that's not as simple as it sounds because you want hot water on demand. And so you're heating hot water already. You know, what you really need is a secondary tank for preheating where you're using your solar array to preheat hot water. Now, there's even a company in, in California experimenting with air conditioners that freeze blocks of ice for air conditioning uh, during area, times of low load or surplus solar production. And this is something we're facing right now on, on one of our projects. Uh, we built kind of a hot rod system, kind of the, the cheapest off-grid system that you could buy. And that might have not have been the best idea. I mean, it was super high output, very small leaded at lead acid battery, and and you know, right out of the box, and this is largely because this this home uh over the course of construction went from a home for two people to live in to a five thousand square foot party mansion with all electric everything and a hot tub and a well and uh, just ton and four refrigerators and tons and tons of heavy use appliances and it's really outperforming the capabilities of our little hot rod system. I would not recommend cheaping out on an off-grid system and, and I'm meaning like even sixty thousand dollars for a whole house off-grid is still on the very low end of the spectrum especially for a large home where you're not doing any energy management. So, you know, our next step on this home is to go after the controls, to have a, a smart home where we're monitoring the electrical load and anytime there's a surge in the base load to have it relate to the thermostat, hey, hold back on the air conditioning for a little bit until the load drops back down. You know, turn off the dehumidifier until the load drops back down. Um, eventually, we're going to have a smart grid class. I mean, a smart home class. We're still getting through the install right now. I recently got the doorbell to talk to the in-home audio, and that made me feel pretty good. Yeah, now we're trying to get into true control systems, though, for energy management. We'll be working on that uh, over the weeks to come. Well, some bounce of system material trends, some cable trays. You know, I think that that using cable tray as opposed to conduit uh, results in a much more professional install. And and you know, cable tray costs more money, but it's on a commercial project, it's absolutely worth the cost. Um, Yeah, you know, here there's a, a cable tray installed because there's a whole bunch of circuits. You know, one thing about the DC optimizers is that they have longer circuits. Well, I guess we didn't talk about this yet. Um, 
you know, someone had asked, well, what about really long distances between the, the array? And here's our, our solar array and the, the home. You know, one thing that the DC optimizers do, you know, microinverters are not very good for long distance runs from the home because the array is going to operate around 600 volts. Uh, AC output right at the array is going to drop that down to 240 volts. And so, you know, generally you want higher voltages to transmit energy over long distances. What the DC optimizer system does is coming out of the array, it controls the voltage. And so one module uh, gets shaded, it'll boost the output voltage from one module and decrease the output amperage so that that fluctuating voltage is now held stable. And so if your array is far away from your point of interconnection, using the DC optimizer system is nice because it's actually going to serve to step the voltage up to a high voltage of the home run circuit. And additionally, a higher voltage means a lower amperage. And so with these DC optimizer circuits, uh, you can fit longer circuits because you can have higher voltage and less amperage. That means you can put more modules along the same cable. Usually with your cable thickness, the amperage is going to be the limiting factor before the voltage is. So we talked about thermal imaging. Scanning for modules for faulty points and failure points. Now, here are some, some costs for reference. You know, some of these parts we've talked about in, in class, you know, inverters, number 10 cable, bare copper, solar clips costing 13 cents each. So these are just more for... Uh, uh, these are the, the Wyland, um, here are the MC4 connectors costing about $1.50 each. Uh, Versa brackets for the metal roof, lightning arresters, just for, for general thought. Now this is kind of a, a do-it-yourselfer budget where you're still hiring some electricians to kind of bless the project put it through any inspection process. And actually in this project, we the, the do-it-yourselfer client hired the electricians to come out to the day to help with the uh, interconnection wiring. So, you know, having electricians come out for a day or two, you know, putting in some of the legwork yourself, you know, maybe hiring a, you know, designer to make the do-it-yourselfer steps a little bit easier. Now, we were able to get back in 2016, you know, uh, a good 7 kilowatt array at a 220 a watt installation price. Project pricing has kind of held pretty sim stable since then because of import tariffs. You know, but what I'm saying is by doing the design work yourself and separating out the design from the labor, you can usually result in a lower project cost than what a turnkey provider is going to charge you because you're taking on more risk and doing the design work and project management work or a lot of it on your own. Um, so these budgets have, have held pretty good since 2016. Inverter pricing has dropped a little bit. Module pricing has dropped a little bit. So how do you calculate your solar payback? You know, assuming you have net metering, you take your installation price, you back up the tax credit, you divide your installation price by your annual production and how much that value is worth. And so we take our annual production, which is a, a figure we can get from PV watts, and our effective generation rate which is easy to determine if you have net metering. If you don't have net metering, we're going to get that to that in a minute. We can see if we had a 250 a watt installation price, you know, after the tax credit, we come down to a dollar 
26 a watt. You know, if we have 1.4 kilowatt hours a year, 11 cents a kilowatt hour, that gets us to, uh, you know, a, a, I, I like crunching these two numbers together to know how many watts per year my economic payback is. And that gets us to an eight-year payback. Most customers are going to want a solar payback of at least under 12 years. That could be very difficult to do. You know, some customers don't care about the payback so much, but most do. And in the interest of time, I'm going to cover very quickly the remaining slides, the most important takeaways. One is the tax credit is dropping down next year to 26%. Not a big difference. And it'll hover that way for another two years. So, you know, 2021, 2022, or, or 2020 and 2021 are going to be good years for solar. We're going to see a little bit of a crunch at the end of 2019 as well. And then in 2023, the tax credit drops down to 10%. So 2022 is going to be another crunch year for solar, unless nothing changes about the tax credit. And, you know, I'm one of the rare installers who I wouldn't really care too much if the tax credit went away. I think you know, I think environmentally clean technologies deserve to be rewarded over other technologies that are not environmentally clean. Uh, but I don't know if the tax credit is the best way to do it moving forward. Um, you know, I think that fair consumer policy for buyback rates is more important but maybe the tax credit is a little bit more politically feasible than other kinds of structures. Now we talk about this stuff in our off-grid class on how to convert an electric bill into a load profile, but the short of it is you need to use computer modeling. Um, we talked about appraisal value. This is just some, some additional information if you want to look into it. The, the main thing with economics you have to look out for is for businesses, if you get an installer that tells you a commercial system is better than a residential because you get depreciation, the thing that's left out of many commercial cash flow models is that, yes, you get to claim depreciation, but also you have to pay income tax on the revenue stream of the solar array because you don't have those deductible costs anymore. Instead, you have profit and you pay profit income tax on your profit. So residential customers, you don't get depreciation, but you don't need to worry about paying income tax on the revenue that your solar array provides. You're just seeing that as you know post-tax revenue reductions in your electric bill. With commercial, you get depreciation, but you also have to model the tax effect of income tax. So again, that's where commercial modeling software really comes into play. Uh, there's a great software out there called Energy Toolbase that makes cash flow models that are clear enough to make a CFO smile. What I really like about Energy Toolbase is that they also are very good at batteries. And as we learn in our battery class, uh, and particularly our commercial battery class on commercial solar peakers, uh, the, the rate structures of commercial businesses are different than that for residential. And so even though residential batteries are primarily used for backup power or for going off grid, neither application being particularly economic, commercial batteries can be very economic based on how uh, the customer is being billed for their electricity, an energy tool belt base can help get you there. Uh, but, but essentially, rapid model, you know, commercial design software allows you to rapidly model your design to get your array size, to generate national electric code reports. Uh, the Desire website, dsireusa.org, is a good website to go to to check out your interconnection policies and your net metering policies. 
You can also find sales tax exemptions and property tax exemptions and maybe local incentives, although those rarely exist nowadays. In the interest of time, some of this is just interesting filler. Solar is uh, in 2018 is about uh, 2% of our electric grid. Now in 2019, we're, we're kind of running towards 3%, which is incredible. Uh, you know, this is just kind of mar market reports. Back on what we were saying about the commercial batteries, it's all about taking, deploying the battery at the very spikiest of peak times. And this very spiky peak can be 70% of a commercial electric bill. And so having a solar array charge a battery and deploying at peak times, you can reduce your bill by 30%, even though the solar array is only doing 10% of your facility management because you're, you're deploying it right when it needs to be deployed. And in that manner, a very expensive battery and a very small solar array can still be cost effective, but you have to have the right rate structure for it Demand-based rate structures are, are measured in kilowatts rather than kilowatt hours, and typically they're only available to commercial customers. So that's a, another thing installers don't really realize is that demand rate structures can actually be better for solar payback than non-demand. Uh, while they include need to have batteries to work, you know, a solar array with a battery is a more complete system. Uh, we talk about community solar in our commercial solar peaker class. Yeah, you know, here's another project budget for you to reference just as an example budget. This is kind of like the, the low end of the budget. This is a project. This is based off a real project that I did last year, um, buying all black modules at 44 cents a watt. You know, having uh, the only thing we did differently in this project is we upgraded our inverter to a battery inverter. So our inverter budget was a little bit more expensive than need be. And then I, I put on some additional costs for for batteries. And so I would say for, for a grid tie project, uh, you're looking at, you know, very good quality budgets under uh, designing the array and subcontracting out all of the labor. You know, they can be had for $250 a watt, even though regional pricing is a little bit larger than that. Uh, Off-grid pricing, you know, it starts to get a lot more expensive, you know, 4 or $5 a watt. And the lower, less you spend on off-grid, the more risky it becomes. And you can find wiring manuals and stuff in the manufacturer um, provided information. Uh, with that, we're out of time. These are kind of topics that we cover in later programs. If you didn't get all of your questions answered, you can feel free to email me or visit my website and use the chat widget to, to ask a question. Um, you know, I try and put it in a lot more information in here than, than uh, so that you can use it as a reference manual. So feel free to you know, take a look at the other content on the website and get back to me with any questions. I'm always happy to answer audience questions. <laughs>